Good morning, and welcome to the Florence Digitalization Summer Conference, Global Data Governance. And my name is Eric Jones, and I'm the director of the Robert Schumann Center, which is the institution, institutional part of the European University Institute that's very fortunate to host Pierluigi Parco and his team running what we now call the Center for the Digital Society. Now, this <clears throat> Florence Digitalization Summer Conference is, a, is an event that has a longer history than the CDS does, but it is an important event in marking the consolidation of the work that we're doing with Pier, Pierluigi and his team uh, in trying better to understand the impact of this digital world on the society, the politics, the economics in which we live. And obviously, a crucial element in that is the governance of data. This governance of data has become probably the central theme in conversations between the United States and Europe, between the United States, Europe, and China. And the idea that we can come up with a governance arrangement that works globally, I think is one that is important for us to tackle today at a time when politically, it seems as though the governance of data is more likely to fracture than to come together. And the prospect of a fracturing of the governance of data is something that I should say from the foreign policy community is a, a, a cause for concern that we worry about, not simply because of what it means for today, but because of what it means for the development of our economic potential looking ahead to the future. Now, I know you guys have a very rich agenda over the next day and a half. I want to thank you all for joining us here in Florence. We've arranged the temperature to remind you that you are in Italy in the middle of the summer. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank those of you who are joining us online as well. We continue to use these hybrid events in order to extend the reach of our conversation. We're grateful for all of you who participate online because we realize it's an exhausting endeavor, particularly over such a long period. But we hope that you will benefit just as much as those who are here. And, and I want to thank you all for the work uh, that you put into this. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Ori Schwartz, uh, who will do another institutional introduction. But thank you for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good morning. I would like to, uh, to welcome you to this joint European University Institute OECD conference on global data governance. Um, we are now in a crucial point for data policy and data governance. For years, we have seen uh, uh, data and its rapidly growing usage becoming a growing source of both benefits and risks for consumers and economies. From a competition policy point of view, the growing use of data has brought with it new and improved products and services for consumer, which is very much desired. But data can also give rise to market power and raise barrier to entry. And it is um, data sharing that can open the door for, to entry of new competitors. It is not surprising to see that new pro-competitive legislations uh, like the EU DMA addresses issues like data portability and interoperability as drivers for competition. But, from a privacy perspective, for example, both the gathering of data, especially personal data, and its sharing raise significant concerns. The optimal data protection balance point may not be so close to the competitions one. And of course, on top of that, we should take into account additional policy areas, for example, consumer protection. A narrow approach to data policy and regulation including through case-by-case -case exposed remedies in competition cases is not sufficient anymore and a wider, broader approach is required. And indeed, uh, the European legislations provide a good example on the need to regulate, or should I say re-regulate, the use of data from more than one angle. With the GDPR, the DMA, and soon to be the Data Act, it is particularly crucial that different policy areas interact with each other, to, so to create a coherent, consistent, efficient, and effective regulatory framework. 
For this purpose, uh, we have gathered here today policymakers, regulators, enforcers, academics, and the business sector to discuss these burning issues. I would like to conclude uh, my opening remarks by thanking our colleagues from the EUI, Eric Jones, Pierluigi Paco, and Marco Botta for the close collaboration and for hosting us in this outstanding venue. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, I will say also a few words uh, of introduction and then uh, we will smoothly move to the first panel that I'm chairing. Uh, I know that Eric has to go, so if you have, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Now it works. Okay, well, uh, let me say a few words about the Center for the Digital Society. We were joking yesterday on Twitter because there was a, a, a launch by the Robert Schumann Center that is uh, in his third year, so is uh, doing things about uh, advertising uh, his milestones. And then uh, there was uh, this uh, tweet yesterday saying that one milestone was that we create the Center for the Digital Society last year. And I say, I reacted saying, yes, but he's a toddler. He's promising, but he's, as a milestone, it's a bit new. Uh, so the Center for Digital Society is actually uh, the merging of two schools, uh, the Florence School of Regulation, Communications and Media that was established in 2009, and the Florence Competition Program established in 2016. The two, uh, the two schools uh, have merged in this new Center for Digital Society that has uh, uh, more or less the traditional area that the schools were uh, dealing with, competition, obviously, regulation and innovation, and also has opened a, a view on digital democracy as a new area of, uh, of uh, interest. And uh, the activities are in the tradition, research activity, executive training, and as this one, policy events. So uh, we are trying to enlarge to the digital transformation our uh, previous legacy in telecommunication, uh, media, and competition. Um, about uh, executive uh, training and planning, we are in the, at this very moment uh, running the uh, last uh, module of our uh, annual training that is uh, in the third edition in this form, so, um, all online. This was a COVID uh, legacy, but uh, is working well. And so we are keeping it because it allows people from many other areas of the world to connect and to participate to our training uh, also with our traditional people, but we are coming back on um, also on uh, um, more online activity, uh, on, on presence activity, and I will explain it in a second. Uh, as I say, the, the, we, the, the last module, regulating digital platforms, is uh, uh, in the making, and some of the participants to this module, all the participants to this module have been invited to join this conference to be part of this conference, both in presence or online. Um, instead, we are also coming back, it's time to do it uh, with more uh, in-presence activity, also in training. Uh, we have two parallel schools uh, in October. We'll have the Florence Patent Licenses Academy, in which we work on uh, patents, as I said, standard essential patents and things, uh, and anyway, uh, more on innovation. And in parallel, there will be the Florence Competition to School, in which we have uh, this uh, uh, in-presence training on the uh, relevant uh, development in competition, uh, law, and economics. Um, at the end of these two courses, the 19 and 20 of October, we will have the next important policy conference that will be on a topic, uh, what we call the autumn conference, that will be on a topic that is uh, very hot, that is fairness in the digital age. Difficult topic, we'll see how the conference uh, uh, will face the fairness issue. Um, here I present our uh, CDS core team. It's a 
that is uh, enlarged because we have, as I say, merged the two groups. And uh, here we have the CDS scientific committee that is uh, a vast committee. Maybe it could be enlarged a little bit more also because we are looking into these new areas like digital democracy. But uh, this is our, uh, and we thank all the scientific committee. Some of them are here and some will speak in this conference. And uh, so we always appreciate the support. Um, we uh, appreciate also the support of uh, institutional media partners who is this year, so I thank them uh, for the co-organizing with us this uh, conference and many other events. Um, and there are uh, UNCTAD, other, and then several media partners. Let me also uh, thank many market donors of the year 22-23. Here you have a list. Uh, there are many companies, important companies, smaller companies, law firms, consultants. Thank you very much for the support. Uh, this uh, makes possible all this activity. Um, today, uh, today uh, we have, uh, as I was said, uh, an event on data. We thought that uh, we co-organize, as I say, with OECD, with OECD Secretariat, and uh, clearly there is this idea that data are uh, the new richness, the new oil, uh, they are so important. And clearly we know that this is uh, that is important, but there is a little bit of some paradox that we want to discuss in this event. For instance, one paradox that maybe we'll start also in the first panel is, while uh, data sharing is so limited at the moment, uh, we'll discuss this in the panel, particularly business to business data sharing. If they are so important, there are such a, a a, an important input for uh, productivity and efficiency. Oil is exchanged, that are exchanged much less. So we want to the, discuss this. Um, clearly, however, data uh, allow to release new products, foster innovation, uh, provide personal service to customers in a way that is unprecedented in history and reduce production cost. So all the good things that uh, the new data era is uh, bringing to us are there. There are also some problems, clearly, but we will discuss also those in this conference. But uh, then some, par some paradoxes remain. Um, how is organized the conference? We is organizing five panels. Uh, we will start in a moment the panel on economics of data sharing that is taught as an introductory panel for uh, uh, starting from the economics of data and that, uh, of data sharing in particular, then we'll have a panel in the afternoon. And immediately after the first panel, we'll have the keynote speech of uh, Vera Pilar del Castillo from the EU Parliament. Then after lunch, we'll go for a panel on competition policy versus sector regulation. Then we'll uh, dip into protection versus sharing of personal data. By the way, this is one of the uh, tension, let's say, trade-offs in the data discussion. Then tomorrow we have two more panels, interoperability and data portability, very important issue uh, to discuss uh, also some of the technical issue of this uh, use of data. And finally, we'll have an interesting panel on assessing the value of data. That is also a piece of the discussion that should be uh, really faced. Um, Okay, I think these are more or less the elements to start. Um, the format is hybrid, as you know. Uh, the conference is all uh, broadcast via Zoom. Um, participants uh, via Zoom can use the chat box to ask questions. Uh, there will be also some polls, I, I think, at some a certain point of the conference. But the video recording will be available in our event web page, as normally we do. If you want to participate also or to the conference via Twitter, you can use uh, hashtag AUIDigital2023. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I think I can move smoothly to the first panel that I'm chairing. Uh, let's see if I have a presentation. Should be here somewhere. Yeah, it's coming. Okay. Uh, I will uh, introduce the first panel, as I said, uh, that is on the economics of data sharing, incentives and market failures. Um, I have a few slides, but uh, mine will be a short introduction. We have a very high level panel that will discuss uh, 
this issue in detail. Uh, let me just uh, open the, the discussion. Um, clearly, uh, data sharing uh, is uh, uh, at the cross of different, uh, different issues. First is the issue of the distinction between personal and non-personal data, and this is clearly a very important, uh, a very important theme that uh, um, sets a distinction. As we know, we have uh, regulation in Europe for, for personal data. Uh, we are discussing regulation for the data in general, and there is an important divide there. So the issue is how much data can, uh, which data can be shared, and which, which rules the data can be shared. And uh, we will discuss this. Um, then there is the, the issue of uh, data, um, if you want a sale, exchange, how to remunerate the exchange, and so on, that is the business part of this uh, data sharing question. Um, as we know, uh, the Europe is in the moment in which is, is investing uh, on regulation of the digital world. And clearly this is also uh, touching a lot about the data question. Uh, and this is done through uh, two, I would say, two different ways of uh, regulating. There is a lot of direct regulation of data. We have the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, uh, certain sector-specific rules that regulate directly data. The GDPR, obviously, is the established uh, personal data regulation. But then all the action on digital markets, all the regulation on digital markets, the MA, the SA, all this regulation, the AI Act, all impact also the data sharing and the data use in general. So we see we are here in, the, uh, in front of a regulation that is uh, uh, specific and general at the same time. And that's probably uh, because data have this uh, nature uh, of it being really a general input. Um, some example to the potential of data, but I don't stop on this, but uh, for instance, Meta with uh, the movement range maps during COVID. Uh, this shows how people were moving through uh, the world during the COVID, how they were st stuck, how they were moving. It's a in very interesting potential application of the data information, just an example. Uh, uh, Google uh, Environmental Insight Explorer, that's another instrument. It looks at the possibility, the risks, the uh, potential for, uh, for uh, pollution, for contrasting pollution, for substituting energy, for a sort of map of the reality in the, the, uh, under the angle of the, uh, of the um, environmental issue, the climate change issues a huge potential of data application or data analysis. Uh, this is a, a, the idea of the digital twin and smart cities, the future of logistics. The idea that you can simply replicate all our cities and study all the dimension of transport, of uh, uh, mobility, uh, of uh, shipment, uh, in all the uh, practical dimension, and you can replicate and improve on any uh, and there are very important experiments in this, uh, tracking the value chain, the product movements, uh, the change of information, the supply chain. That's a, a no, huge potential also in this. So you see, examples are uh, incredibly vast and incredibly important. Uh, there are some business models that are emerging, even in the business-to-business -business, uh, relation. Uh, certain data platforms uh, that uh, pulls data, non-personal data in this case, and become uh, uh, help uh, relate uh, security interoperability in a sector. Skywise for air companies is an example. Uh, there are marketplaces that are emerging in which there is uh, matchmakers in which data transaction exchange uh, between potential data suppliers and buyers. Uh, Snowflakes is an example of a multi-sectoral data repository. 
technical enablers, intermediaries that provide a new uh, number of service to uh, data suppliers and reception to facilitate transaction. For instance, Nalian is for cargo transportation. I have to say that my impression in looking at this emerging business model of data sharing uh, is that uh, we are a bit behind respect to the potentiality that I just uh, show for, for the data. And uh, this uh, sharing is, is very sectoral at the moment, much more sectoral than one would expect if data have this uh, general dimension. That's uh, uh, my first uh, consideration on this. Uh, so I think that we are in front of what I was defining a, a, a paradox, the paradox of data sharing. Uh, there is a growing data generation, but there is a low level of data sharing. And we, this is one of the things we want to discuss in this panel. Uh, try to understand incentives and market failures. Um, I will be quickly on this. The benefits uh, are clearly data sharing is a re reusable input. Uh, it's easy to do in theory through APIs, uh, can lower production cost, facilitate market entry, uh, can help in a lot of social environmental challenges, so more data, uh, more ability to respond in many situations. But there are obstacles. Uh, obstacles I would uh, categorize in three areas. Technical obstacles. There is a lack of interoperability that need to be faced. It's technical and semantic, the organization of data, the old issue of the data standardization that has been faced in the past. Sometimes there is a lack of compatibility, different granularity, different uh, taxonomy, and so on. There is some cybersecurity risk, especially if we are talking about uh, data sh sharing in real time. And obviously there are uh, the normal uh, trade-offs with privacy, privacy concerns. Uh, then there is economic obstacles, possible market failure, uh, non-rival goods, uh, simultaneous use uh, could deplete uh, some of the values, economic scale of scale and scope, uh, the information acquires value in its dimension, sometimes the big data issue. So this could be sometime an element of market failure. Uh, there is the market power, the control of few data holders who owns uh, many data, sometimes as a strategic advantage and is not ready to, to data sharing. That's an issue, obviously. Then there is a uh, transaction cost, information asymmetries that are important as in many markets, but in this market are particularly pervasive, probably. And finally, there is formal and informal institutional barriers. Lack of experience, uh, especially small firms, but in general, local governments and so on, are unfamiliar and unaware of the opportunity of data sharing. We have worked with authorities, have done uh, courses with authority, trying to discuss with them the importance of their own data. And sometimes we, we perceive that uh, even the authorities don't have clear how many data they have and how they could use them. Uh, then there is the reputational risk. It's clear that uh, if you have a, a an event like uh, Cambridge Analytica in which uh, comes uh, to reality that uh, comes to public knowledge that you have been uh, giving your data, the data produced by your consumer in a, an, with an awareness or, or lightness and create a damage, uh, that's uh, strong reputational risks. These kind of risks are there. There are legal uncertainties because uh, the framework, as I said, is a, a, an, evo an evolution of the regulatory framework of data, and there are still important uncertainties. And there are uh, legal concerns, uh, particularly between borders, area of the world, and so also this is uh, uh, an issue of uh, sometimes ownership rights are not clear. So these are all the issues. So we see, we see barriers of different nature. So the advantage of data sharing is clear. Uh, the difficulties, economic, institutional, and technical are there. So this is exactly what we want to discuss today with our panelists. Uh, I have a series of questions for them, which are, what are the major market failures of our data sharing in their opinion? What are the main business models that can support new market solution? Uh, how to avoid uh, to the so-called uh, one-size-fits-all policy approach, given uh, market failures and uh, different type of data? 
what institutional model can favor a win-win scenario between public and private sphere, what is possible, uh, their possible role for intermediaries well discussed in regulation, and which kind of incentives are needed to have the emergence of effective uh, intermediaries. Is the European Union regulation on data sharing on the right track to address all these market issues? Uh, what are the major trade-offs at play in the current scenario? Data silos versus data sharing, privacy regulation versus data-driven innovation. These are the doubts. Uh, these data silos, will, I, I know, will be discussed in the panel. Uh, we have uh, decisions that say you cannot uh, put together the data, but then we want the data sharing. That's, that's, um, is clear, there is clear attention. And another very classic tension is between privacy and uh, uh, data-driven innovation. Uh, the panelists, uh, we have uh, Philip Heller, director of NERA. By the way, uh, the panelists that are here can join at this point. I think it would be better. And uh, um, then we have Anna Becker, Becker from a, a triple C. I think Anna will, is connecting from this band. We'll ask her in a second where is she. Um, then we have Antonio Manganelli uh, and Mario Denni. So three out of four are here, okay? Okay, I think we have uh, set the stage for the start. The questions are uh, there. Maybe I leave uh, the questions on the, uh, on the screen. And uh, I think we agreed on an order of intervention in which uh, Philip was the first to open the discussion. Philip, please. Well, first of all, thank you, Pierre Luigi, for uh, the, the nice introduction, and also uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak on this uh, very uh, interesting panel. Now, maybe before I go into the incentives and, and market failures related to data, I, I just wanted to share some observation that I actually had coming to this conference uh, and uh, at the airport. So I, I was actually reading a book uh, called expected goals, the story of how data conquered football and changed the game forever. And so while I was reading it, at some point it occurred to me, wait, I'm going to a conference to discuss the role of data governance and the market failures related to data. I wonder whether there's any data failure uh, or, or market failure related to data related to football. And try as I might, I could not actually find a market failure with, with, respect, with respect to data in, in football. So there's a, a variety of companies that actually uh, have uh, people watching the games, collecting all the data about all of the events that take place on the pitch to try to create value for, for a team. So companies like Opta or Prozone or Stats DNA. And I thought, well, that's not really a market failure here precisely because the, the, the activity of data gathering in this instance is just like a normal service industry. So that you have firms that can compete in the market for, for the data that they collect and that they then sell on to publishers or, or football clubs that uh, want to make use of this data. And so I didn't really see a market failure there. And so I think one thing that I think would be important to keep in mind that while we're discussing market failures related to data, that does not mean that there necessarily will be some market failure when, when, when data is involved. It can be that there are a lot of functioning markets that relate to the use of data that uh, don't really have a special need for particular attention uh, to them. Now, having said that, let us uh, then turn to uh, actual market failures and the incentives related to them. And uh, here, I. I say it's also uh, important to come back to, to one of the statements that Pierluigi made on data being the new oil uh, in, the, in the 21st century. And there, I would actually have to, to disagree a little bit because we're not really having discussions on market failures relating to oil and a sp special regulatory framework for, for oil. Now, of course, there are environmental externalities related to oil. But uh, my experience has usually been that if I use an oil-related product like gasoline, if I fill up my, my, my car's tank, at the end of the day, if I drive around with it, then I tend to has, have less, of, uh, less gasoline in my tank. And with data, I don't really have the same problem. So if I tell 50 people my name and uh, where I had a sandwich this morning, then I can still tell another 50 people that information. And uh, there's essentially no limit to how much I can, can, I can share that data. 
And this is the, the, the reason why we are actually discussing market failures to data, because there are some special properties related to data that mean that uh, it doesn't quite work like the market for oil. And so regarding the market failures there, there are actually two that I would say are, are, are quite important. The first one is kind of traditional, that's just market power, which I will turn to later. And the other one is uh, social data privacy externalities. And that maybe requires a little, little bit more explanation. And, and so here, the, the, the starting point is the so-called privacy paradox. And the, the, the privacy paradox basically refers to the fact that there's a lot of discussion about how valuable privacy is and how consumers care about their privacy and they don't want companies or governments to know too much about them. And yet, when people then interact with large uh, tech platforms, they willingly share their data with very, very little compensation. And so you, on the one hand, you have the stated claims that you know, privacy is very important, data is very valuable, and at the same time, it's given away for essentially free. And, and so that's uh, a bit inconsistent. And the, the theory there that some academics have developed is that uh, with, with data on, say, uh, social, social networks, if I know something about person A, then that essentially means I can also know a little bit more about person B. And so if other people that are also on the same platform as I am share their information, then that means that the platform already has quite a lot of information about this other person that has not yet shared their, their information. And so that person, by sharing their data as well, will only give up a little bit of their privacy because their privacy, privacy has already been eroded by other people sharing their information. And so that way you can have a situation where for your individual choice of whether to share your data or not, you're willing to do it at very low compensation because essentially the company already has quite a lot of information. And yet overall, you may have had a preference for no data to have been shared, but you simply cannot control this because other people are sharing that data. And I think that's uh, an, an important consideration. Now, whether that's quantitatively important is, I guess, an open question. And there'll be a panel that's dedicated to quantifying the, 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 the value of data. So that's all I will say about this here and instead turn to the more traditional theme of market power uh, related to data. And there again, I would say that there's essentially not much new there. So data could also be another term for just knowledge and knowledge has been quite important. And there's actually a regulatory framework related to knowledge and knowledge sharing. So that's the patent law and other intellectual property laws. And there, these laws actually respond to the market failure that if you generate knowledge, the fact that it's very easy to share and copy that knowledge, that could create an incentive where if you generate the knowledge and it's being shared, then you may not actually benefit from your, from your investment in creating this knowledge. And so there needs to be a special regime to protect your, your investment into generating that data, uh, that, 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 that knowledge. And that's why you have um, patent laws. And with, with patent uh, protected innovations, there's essentially uh, not much surprise that the, the companies or the innovators that have invented something are unwilling to share that uh, knowledge for, for free. And essentially that's the whole point of the, the regulatory re regime, that by protecting the innovation, you essentially allow the companies to restrict the use of that knowledge for a limited period of time. And so essentially something similar is happening uh, with, with, with data. If you're having some unique data that you know, somehow you've, you've generated, then essentially you're, you're not really having an incentive to, to make that freely available to anyone, uh, simply because you can make more profit by, by not doing that and trying to use it on your own and not sharing it with your um, competitors. So from that perspective, uh, and so when comparing data and intellectual uh, property, that, that really raises the question, so what's, what's special about data? And, and I think here, the, the, the reason that we should care more about this kind of market power with, with regard to data, I think is the, this widespread perception that some of the data that's being generated doesn't, is not really the consequence of a lot of special investment. And so some instances where data is being generated essentially as a byproduct of a normal investment is when some device manufacturer creates a product that because of new technologies now is also able to collect data, then the, the data is kind of just almost uh, falling, uh, falling from the sky naturally. And so the investment has been to, to create the product, 
by the company, and so the product, uh, company can sell the product, but the data is kind of just the, a, a byproduct. And so then, given that it's essentially created for almost free for that company, it's seen as unfair that this one company that created the device uh, can, can just use its market power for that data in, uh, as, it, as it wishes. Relatedly, if, if there's an industry where you, you want to have a wide coverage of data sharing, so Pierluigi mentioned the, the case of uh, cities, and if you think of connected cars, if you want to have an efficient traffic management system, you essentially need everyone to share their information about the location of cars and their direction of travel. And so if every essentially uh, OEM manufacturer is able to keep that data and extract a high price, then you have a standard problem of complementarity. So you essentially need someone to collect all of the data, but you need to get collect it from a large group of firms, all of which have market power. And there's a saying in economics that the only thing that's worse than a monopoly is a chain of two monopolies. And in this case, you would probably have a, a large number of monopolies. And so that creates an additional problem and may lead to an inefficiently low amount of, of data sharing. And that, that's the reason why in this partic particular case, we may be more concerned about market power than maybe in other industries. Now, that then brings me to how to go about uh, addressing this problem. And uh, I think there, uh, the panels that will follow this one, I think already give a suggestion of how one may, may go about this. So we, we, we're going to discuss later on uh, the role of competition policy and sector specific regulation and compatibility requirements. And I think that's uh, basically what you can uh, say about how to solve these, these issues. So you need some, some way to reduce the market power, which you can for, do, for example, by imposing obligations on the data holders to, to license their data at either zero fee, at a fee that's at the level of cost of creating the data, or at uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, uh, terms. So essentially like the friend commitments that are familiar from standard essential patterns. And uh, those are then the ways to address these market failures. And with that, I would then uh, pass on to the next speaker on the panel. Thank you. Philip was a very interesting start. And uh, I think that this idea to work on, uh, uh, on the relation between data and patents is, uh, is interesting. We'll have to discuss it. And also this uh, issue of double monopolization should be, as you said, one of the issues that we have to look into these markets. But uh, let's make a long jump when we go to Anna Berker, that uh, I think she's in Brisbane. Let's hear from Anna what uh, she has to tell us. Thank Anna. you for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, I wish I was there in person because uh, Florence is a beautiful city and I'm sure in the middle of summer it's um, spectacular. So um, anyway, it is great to be with you virtually, if not in person, to speak about this really interesting topic. Um, I hope not to be too repetitive, but I just want to take a step back and sort of start with sort of the perspective of data from the business perspective um, starting off. So I want to talk a little bit about why it is that businesses collect data. I um, also want to talk a bit about the types of data they can collect. So why they collect data, um, what, the, what they use that for, what incentives that creates for sharing data, um, and some of the associated market failures that mean perhaps it's shared less or perhaps more than socially optimal. Um, I haven't gone too much into the policy implications because I think some others are, are dealing with this, but I'm very happy to touch on that later in the questions. So I'll just start off first with um, why do businesses collect data? So as um, Philip was saying, sometimes data is a byproduct of a business's core functions, um, but sometimes it's actually something that businesses are actively pursued alongside or even separate to its core business. So in this way, it can sort of be passive or active, and it can also start perhaps as something passive and then move towards something more active once the value of the data is recognised. There's also a difference between first party data, and that's the data collected about a business's customers versus third party data, which might be something that's collected via APIs or cookies traditionally um, on a website, for example, tracking the movements of um, consumers going through that website. 
Now, more data has been collected than ever before. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of those being that collection is generally um, relatively cheap, whether that's first party or third party data. And that's decreased, those costs have decreased over time. In addition, the cost of storage, while not free, have decreased over time, especially with the growth in cloud services. And the value of data is being uh, better recognised than it ever was before. Also, computing power has increased, um, as has model specification, as we're seeing now with the uptake of various forms of AI technologies. So there's a range of data that businesses collect. So they can collect data about their business and their operations, um, data about the suppliers, um, the business's suppliers. So for example, Amazon collects a range of data on products sold and suppliers of products, including sales, prices, types of delivery, ratings and reviews. There can also be data collected on consumers. So metas are collecting all sorts of information, including likes and dislikes, political views, everything from gender, sexual preferences, friendship groups, and the list goes on. So how do businesses use this data? It can be used a lot of ways. So um, fundamentally, a lot of businesses use this to increase the quality or functionality of their core services. It can also be used to um, increase personalization. So, um, that can be the products themselves, so targeting products towards specific, specific groups once you know more about them or via advertising. It can also be trained, uh, used to train machine learning and artificial intelligence um, and also for selling advertising and other targeted services. And some businesses also go about selling the data directly to other businesses. So the implications for businesses are that data can be very valuable. Um, the, the widespread availability of data has also driven new business models, and that's underpinning a lot of our digital market services we're seeing today, um, the so-called free services that are underpinned by targeted advertising, because that data is really key for digital advertising. So I just want to step through a little bit about why we might want businesses to share their data. Um, just like data is valuable for the business who collects it, that data can often be very valuable for another business. So it can improve their efficiency, it can improve insights about their customers, it can improve um, insights and the ability to target. So a lot of the same things that the business itself will be able to do like it. Um, because it's non-rivalrous, as already mentioned, um, use by one business does not diminish use by another. And that's one of the reasons why it's, um, you know, something socially it makes a lot of sense to use that. Philip also discussed some of the externalities associated with, um, with data. So at an individual level, if a data if a business, sorry, knows something about a consumer, it may be able to categorize that consumer and infer other information about them based on what it knows about the type of consumer more generally. So for example, even if you haven't given away your age or socioeconomic details, your friendship group group membership and engagement on a social network such as Facebook or Instagram may actually reveal that information. At a society level, the ability to combine data from multiple individuals um, can, to form a big data set can allow the data holder to extract useful information about a group of individuals or society more broadly. And this can have really positive impacts for both the individuals who contributed the data as well as society more broadly, depending, of course, on what the data is used for. So I think these have already been used before, but common examples of this are predicting traffic or health outcomes. We've also talked, of course, about market power. Um, so to the extent that data is required to offer a service or to improve a service, businesses may need access to certain types of data. That is, access to relevant data can be a barrier to entry or expansion in some markets. We might especially want other businesses to have access to that data where this is required to address market power and to introduce competition. So that can be especially important, for example, where there are significant economies of scale or network effects in the use of data. So one example of this is the requirement under the EU's Digital Markets Act for gatekeeper providers of search services to share click and query data with other search providers. 
So that's some of the reasons why we might want to share, have businesses sharing more data, but there are also reasons why we might not. So as has already been discussed, privacy concerns. So the way in which a consumer um, shares its data or the way in which consumer data is collected has implications for privacy and competition. So consumer awareness of data collection practices influences their ability to control their personal data. The um, other thing is that consumers' value from keeping personal information private or sharing it is highly context specific. So I might be very willing to share information about my weekend plans with my good friends, but I might not be willing to broadcast that to a wider audience. If consumers do not understand how their business data is being collected and used, then they're less likely to be able to drive effective competition in respect of this. So it can have that implication there as well. Even where certain consumer data is easily collected in various ways and by various parties, access to third party tracking, as well as large and individually identifiable consumer base may provide a business with a particularly valuable set of data that may be difficult for competitors to replicate. Um, sharing of data can have other risks as well, such as risks of identity theft and discrimination. And again, those um, externalities I named before about the ability to infer insights about someone um, can be bad when it does allow them to, for example, um, identify a vulnerability in that consumer that they haven't actually um, shared. In addition, if a business is using a consu consumer data set to micro-target individuals and discriminate against them um, where they would have otherwise withheld that data, um, then this could represent negative externalities. So what are the incentives and in businesses to share information? So I think one of my core message would be, it really depends on the data. Where the data provides a competitive advantage, especially in markets where the business has market power, they're less likely to share this data. Um, but in some cases, for example, where it enables a complementary product or service to be delivered, this may be enabled um, through, for example, giving access to APIs. And we do see a lot that with digital platforms, we see the innovation occurring around the core service rather than directly in competition with that core service. I think as well, one of the reasons we don't see more businesses sharing data is a case of asymmetric or imperfect information and coordination issues. If people don't know, the, or if a business doesn't know what information another business has, for example, um, they may not understand the value to others and they may not be willing to share it. That's, of course, less of a case um, in these uh, digital markets where you've got a lot of market power going on. It also depends on the cost involved in sharing the data and the benefits from sharing that data. Um, and I just want to say, like, even though we're seeing a lot of markets don't share data, there is actually a really lucrative data broker market out there. So some data definitely is being shared. So just before, I won't go much into policies, but there are some implications um, for policies to share data. So making data, uh, business, sorry, making businesses share data obviously has implications for incentives to collect data in the first place. So we have to consider the costs of collecting data and the disincentive this has um, for the collection of data if you have to share it. So, for example, if it's a very costly um, activity that needs a lot of investment and it isn't leading to market power, you really wouldn't want to be doing that, but uh, you want to take it case by case. You also want to think about the benefits of sharing data and the efficiency benefits, whether you're sort of addressing a um, barrier to entry through doing that and other costs. Um, and also it's really important to consider the privacy impacts and assess whether data silos in some cases might be more appropriate. But of course, recognising that data silos or keeping data separate um, has those efficiency implications. So they were the points I wanted to make at this point and happy to take questions later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you. I think that your uh, underlying externalities uh, and also uh, data as a barrier to entry and uh, market power issues that are connected is important. And I think also you're uh, quickly mentioning the issue of the data and discrimination is interesting as it's something uh, I hope uh, will uh, be discussed during the the conference. Uh, we will come back to you as a uh, 
to the other speakers, but uh, for the moment we continue giving the floor uh, to uh, Antonio Manganelli. Antonio. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And um, I, will, I will move a bit uh, from the previous presentation to the more to a more uh, policy centered uh, discussion. So how the European policy legislation try to address uh, to take all this trade off. I, 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 didn't, I wouldn't enter into into details, but uh, just to to mention to give an, an overall impression of the of the uh, policy action at the European level uh, for data sharing, for incentivizing data sharing. And there is, there is actually a broad, as you well know, a broad array of policy initiatives for data sharing, uh, which are differing in terms of scopes, approach, legal tools, and uh, enforcement, enforcement methods. Of course, there is the free flow of non-personal data, which facilitate business-to-business -business data sharing practices. There is the open data directive, uh, which try to put government data to good use for private players. There is the Data Government Act, which of course uh, incentivize the reuse of certain public sector data and promoting the voluntary sharing of data by increasing the trust in neutral and structurally separated intermediaries, which are supposed to help uh, the match the data to match the data demand with the supply. There is of course the ongoing Data and Act proposal, which is uh, aiming at, to unlock machine-generated data and overcome the vendor lock-in, as well as uh, uh, to promote switching for cloud and then services. And of course, there is uh, uh, the GDPR uh, with the data portability provision for individual, which is matched and extended somehow by the Digital Market Act, which also includes some contestability data access uh, provision. And next to this, there are, there are, as Pierluigi mentioned, there are quite a few uh, uh, sector-specific legislation on automotive payment system providers, smart metering information, electricity network data, intelligent, intelligent transport system, renewables, and energy performance of buildings. So there, are, there is also a quite, uh, the European Union is being quite prolific in the sector-specific legislation, and I will, I will explain later why this is this is quite important. And of course, next to the legislation, there is uh, the promotion of the governments and the tax structure, uh, and financement of the tax structure of the EU data spaces, which is the other pillar of the EU data strategies. And so far, the European Union has financed uh, 14, I guess, uh, data, data space, uh, sectoral data space, more, mostly sectoral data space. And, um, these, uh, these, uh, these policy measures that I mentioned all have a different uh, uh, approach, different scope, uh, but also legal, legal methods, enforcement methods. There is horizontal rules versus uh, digital service specific, or so changing from digital service to digital service, uh, for example, like the, 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 cloud, the cloud services, or sector specific. Of course, uh, these, all these approaches are very different, and uh, as explained later, it's not so easy to combine them and to find uh, the, the rule, the, the, the implementation rule that uh, companies and undertakings and individuals uh, could follow. There is also the different approach, mandatory data sharing versus facilitating voluntary sharing, as I mentioned, and also competition like access remedies versus consumer empowerment, like for the, for, the data, for the data portability. And also there is general data rights versus asymmetric data access rights. So uh, symmetric regulation versus asymmetric regulation. Uh, of course, this differentiation uh, also depends on the fact that this, uh, this uh, legislation, these policy tools have been developed in different timing, even if it's uh, like I mean, uh, from the GDPR, only, only seven, seven years passed, but I mean, in, in, the, in the digital world, seven years is, uh, uh, is a lot. Um, so this, this, of course, uh, it's somehow understandable, but could create some, uh, some problem in the, of interpretation and then uh, for the addressing of the, of the market failure and the policy objective that uh, legislation want to pursue. And as for policy objectives, the circulation of data, of course, coexists with other 
as was mentioned before, and we will be detailed in the next uh, in the next panels, um, and coexist with different policy objectives. Of course, privacy, uh, competition enhancement, doing business, and also some geopolitical. For example, when I think about data flow intra EU versus data flow extra EU, and um, of course, not all these policy objectives are uh, in contradiction. There are some. Uh, um, synergies, but somehow sometimes there are trade-offs, even with the, with the same policy objective. So it's very, it's very, the relationship is very, is very dynamic. And, um, but sometimes the, the, one, the one thing that it could be very problematic is the, the trade-off between uh, the legislation and the policy trade-offs. There could be contrasting provisions, which is could quite rare, but most, most, most of the case, uh, there could be some balancing of principle and policy objective uh, between the different uh, pieces of legislation. And here, according to me, there are the main, the main problem uh, because, of course, uh, uh, the, the balancing usually uh, implies some level of uh, interpretation uh, according also who is interpreting uh, the rules, so who is doing the, the, the balancing, and, uh, and, um, and that's why, according to me, uh, in, the, in the digital sphere, uh, compared to other pro-competitive regulation or regulation, there is a much more, uh, there is a, a clearer tendency of the European institution to a centralization of enforcement. But of course, decentralization uh, is not, not complete, and maybe it's, not, it's good that it's not complete. So this balancing uh, between principles and uh, the dynamic of interpretation still remain, uh, still remain a problem. For example, just to give you an example is, the, for example, the, uh, the, the gatekeeper restriction uh, for the benefit of the uh, access uh, which is uh, uh, enshrined in the in the data act uh, so the fact that the gatekeepers cannot uh, uh, can benefit of these rights of course this could be understandable of course to address the trade-off between competition and disaggregation on one side versus sharing of essential input and productive efficiency on the other side but still there is some tension with uh, with the portability of data in the in the gdpr uh, or also the cloud service, uh, if you look to service uh, specific uh, provision, the cloud services, so the data portability and the access to data which is uh, uh, enshrined in the DMA, how is combined with uh, uh, switching and interoperability in the Data Act, which goes well beyond to that. So we could interpret uh, when, when uh, when the data act will be will be approved, uh, a data act as a lex specialist compared to the DMA somehow. Uh, I mean the, the 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 hierarchy of the of the two uh, of the two legislation does not help us because both of them will be uh, regulation. So it's not you cannot uh, apply some hierarchy as for competition law and sector specific regulation. So maybe could be considered in lex specialist also considering what. Uh, what the, in, the, in, the, in the provision that will, be, will be told us about what kind of legislation will be, uh, will be uh, safe. So just to, to conclude this, uh, this overview, I think, I think um, that there are a lot of policy action that, uh, that uh, the European Union has taken in order to address uh, market failure, to facilitate the exchange, and as you Luigi said at the beginning, maybe there is not too much data sharing uh, as one would expect because due to the economics of that, I think my opinion that one, one problem could be exactly what I said about the uncertainty of rules that you also mentioned, but I think, I think it's quite, could be quite a, a problem. And of course, uh, the centralization tendency in the enforcement that uh, the, European, uh, the European Commission is uh, putting into the policy is not uh, completely tackling uh, this, uh, this problem. And I think one of the solutions, for example, something that is in the UK are doing very well is uh, so a proactive uh, uh, activity, a pro proactive uh, coordination, a guidance uh, given by regulators and competition authority uh, for, to clarify how to address the trade-off 
not only the economic trade-off, but also the regulatory and the policy, uh, the policy trade-off. And uh, another thing, it's I think, as in, in accordance with what, what you said, I think it's very true that it, the, the sector-specific rules and the sector-specific actions uh, have been much more effective just because, of course, they enter much more into detailed, also operational details, implementation details. And while the uh, horizontal uh, cross-sectoral or cross-service action are much more general and this interpretation and coordination problem is much more uh, enhanced. And that's, that's something, of course, that uh, it's, it was, was uh, uh, also in the DMA was a kind of, um, was really, were really um, emphasized the fact that, of course, when you try to regulate uh, uh, in the same way services business model which are di very different of course there could be a lot of uh, uncertainty a lot of uh, problems and uh, but still the dma which is a pro competitive regulation uh, could be somehow um, understandable this this approach while for for example the regulation for data sharing it's much it's much more problematic so more more sector specific regulation together jointly with the, uh, the proactive uh, role of regulators and the coordination of the different regulators would uh, which are um, called to enforce this uh, legislation is very much uh, uh, what uh, could try to uh, soften this problem Thank you, Antonio. Uh, yes, I think that uh, this suggestion of Antonio that uh, uh, we are seeing all this centralization from the Commission because uh, uh, the balancing act of this regulation is so, uh, the, all, of all this regulation is so important uh, probably is a good explanation of what is happening, but uh, we will have to see the evolution of this. And uh, I agree that this idea of sector specific regulation uh, that goes more in detail works immediately more immediate in immediate way but uh, that's uh, the, the result is we are seeing more movements in small areas in very precise areas and less in general so it's an explanation of reality but uh, yeah. we will discuss more uh, okay we move to uh, mario denny that is our last panelist for the opening <laughs> to reach from the mic. So let me start by, by of course, uh, thanking uh, Professor Parkour, Massimo Mot and uh, Marco Motasori for uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to this uh, to this conference because it's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, so we actually heard uh, this morning from uh, the previous panelists and from the introduction of Professor Parkour that. Um, of course, there is uh, uh, there is uh, one of the problem with uh, um, with uh, collecting data and data, uh, gathering data um, can be, of course, uh, market power. It's one of the uh, main um, um, failures, market failures that you um, you can have related to um, uh, data um, collection. So, if I think of, of uh, one way of addressing market power, of course, is uh, uh, can be uh, competition and uh, applying competition law. And we also heard from uh, from Anne um, that gathering data and depending on the type, the type of data, uh, the cost of that gathering data and sharing it and the incentives sharing data can be very different. Um, so uh, sometimes uh, the uh, uh, a case by case, case assessment instead of uh, uh, a kind of approach uh, uh, one um, one size fits all uh, can be uh, more uh, effective. Uh, but then, um, if we actually look at what, what's happening, and then uh, Antonio uh, uh, just told us that there are a, lot, a number of uh, police, uh, political initiatives and uh, uh, in terms of regulation, sectoral regulation, so we're moving towards not a case-by-case -case assessment, but more uh, um, a kind of uh, regulatory act which which will apply to all uh, companies or um, uh, specific uh, specific companies so uh, uh, the the topic of my my discussion will be why we actually uh, came to this uh, to this point and why the uh, competition policy somehow is not 
um, thought be uh, the right tool today uh, to address uh, this, this market failure. So, of course, firms have a private step incentive to collect data. And on top of the, we, we heard uh, this from, from Anne. And on top of this, I would, I would say that they have an incentive to collect big data. So it's not about uh, a private information, it's not about a single information, but it's about collecting large data set. So it, because it can, of course, increase product performance, exploit new business opportunities, increase efficiencies, we, um, we know that. And uh, we have seen um, so that big is better than, than small. It means that the uh, collection of and the use of large data set can actually reveal part of information that would not be visible from a smaller data set or individual data points. And it's something which has been uh, um, uh, stressed by Commissioner Vestager back in 2000, uh, 2016, and when she said that the whole point of big, of big data is uh, that it has to be uh, actually big. So uh, with the right tools, you can, uh, which means algorithms, machine machine uh, learning, you can find partners in a large data set that you cannot find in a smaller in a smaller one. And then we've seen from Professor Park this morning that there is a, a significant benefit for for the society to have more uh, uh, data sharing because. There are characteristics of data, non uh, rivalry, non data are not excludable. So uh, many parties can use the same data set for a variety of, of, uh, of purposes uh, without any uh, kind of functional loss uh, to the original uh, data uh, collector. So you have a lot of, uh, in terms of uh, economics, you have a lot of economies of scale and scope, and you have quasi um, zero marginal cost of uh, reuse. Of course, then business to business data shedding can stimulate innovation and, is, and ensure a level, a level playing field. But then at the same time, so we just to just to say that uh, there are studies by uh, the uh, OECD, which says that uh, in fact, the, uh, the indirect impact and the induced impact, so the, the, um, the beneficial effect for the society as a whole can be 10 to 50, 50 times higher in terms of GDP growth than the individual benefit of using, of using, uh, using data. So the, 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 the issue is very, is very relevant, uh, especially because uh, we know that, uh, uh, and we heard that um, uh, uh, firms can have a private incentive which is lower than what the, um, what would be uh, society, uh, um, um, socially desirable to share uh, data. So the, uh, the question is uh, um, that competition policy can really be the uh, right tool to address those, uh, those, uh, those issues. But then when it comes to how the, 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 the um, competition policy has been, has been used to address those issues, we see that the, these goals have not been achieved, at least, at least to me, and that's why we're moving for, towards um, regulation. Of course, uh, data in terms of competition policy from a, a competition uh, uh, perspective uh, can play different roles. Here we are mainly talking about data as an input uh, to uh, develop new services and to compete uh, on the market. And of course, when we, when we uh, think of, of uh, data um, as an input, uh, uh, that can be an, the incentive for, uh, uh, that, ki that can be uh, um, the incentive for uh, um, firms to retain the exclusive control of the data set that they have created and they have collected also costly um, as a source of market power or market control uh, mechanism so of course this would uh, amount to a barrier to entry and uh, and stifle the competition this competition game the game so the competition law can intervene when assessing a merger or uh, when assessing a unilateral conduct by, by, by the firm, but of course uh, 
this intervention uh, um, should actually strike the right balance because uh, it has a lot of drawbacks because of course uh, it can reduce also the innovation incentive and the incentive firm to uh, collect uh, collect data so what the competition enforces us to do is a, a really a careful uh, balancing exercise of pro and anti-competitive effect of intervening and imposing some kind of uh, data sharing to um, um, to firms because and and this uh, this exercise requires a deep a deep understanding of the characteristics of data the economics of the the market and how the competition game uh, is played in a specific a specific market so the type of question that the the competition uh, competition uh, enforcers have to ask is um, uh, of course a kind of indispensability if we want to call it like this so whether the uh, the data is really the key element for entering the market or for um, assuring the, uh, the the success of a product uh, why why i'm saying this because of course there are still a lot of markets where data is a very important input but not more important than the other than other inputs so here we're really talking about what they are called uh, data driven um, uh, sectors so it's in those sectors that of course uh, a, a data can be seen as a, a, a key input uh, then we have to see whether data is the um, gathering of data, is holding the data set, or is the ability to analyze the data, which gives really a competitive advantage to firms before um, addressing this issue and before um, uh, and kind of uh, uh, finding out which is the right instruments to uh, address a market failure if there is if there is one. Um, and then the last question, of course, is a kind of replicability. So the available of other uh, sources of uh, uh, information in the market. That's, of course, the right framework in which the uh, a, a policy intervention uh, and with competition uh, with competition law can be can be um, kind of framed but then if i look at the uh, uh, that's the the kind of paradox so everybody's waiting that the competition tool or thinking that the competition tool can be the right instrument but then if we look at the uh, recent merger, merger decision or um, um, uh, other decision at, under article 102 we see actually there is a, a little bit of disappointing um, result so without entering into the discussion that will be the, the, the subject of, of uh, this afternoon uh, panel i just want to highlight why the uh, the outcome of those decisions has been um, has been such and uh, and to highlight what what are the um, characteristics of the data which led the commission and the competition authorities to um, adopt those decisions of course i'm referring uh, in um, when when uh, merger decision um, uh, uh, when uh, merger decisions are concerned, I'm referring to the well-known, uh, highly criticized uh, Google Double Click, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, Apple Shazam, and the re very recent uh, Google um, Fit. Um, if we look at those decisions, of course, the conclusion that we can draw is that the major control can, does not seem the, uh, to be the, the, best, uh, the best tool to achieve more data sharing between firms because, of course, none of those uh, mergers have been blocked nor some kind of data, sh data sharing um, remedies have been imposed on, on, the merging, on, the, on the merging parties. And why? Because uh, uh, the, uh, According to the assessment made by the Commission of the Competition Authorities, uh, the data set of the target firm or the data set resulting from the uh, combination, the merging of the data set of the combining parties of the emerging parties were not, were not unique. Um, so the um, the data set were, were, um, was not indispensable to for competitors to compete on uh, an equal footing on the on the market. It, it's it's kind of applying the essence, essential facility drop doctrine to the, the merger the merger control. So the, 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 the drivers of the decision really rely on the characteristics of data that we we heard this this morning because the 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 the, the commission and the competition authorities thought that there were other databases available so there was no um, 
uh, need for uh, uh, a kind of imposing any uh, uh, data sharing data sharing obligation on the on the firms and competitors could easily or at least uh, with some some costs but it was not impossible to replicate uh, the uh, database of course this has been uh, highly criticized and and then we've seen that uh, of course uh, uh, consumers can multi-home and can uh, provide data to uh, a number of different platforms so the um, type of data that the, the firms were using and collecting were were not unique and in some cases of course there was the inter played with, with the privacy rules uh, which have been already underlined so I don't want to stress. So just to say that the fear rouge of those decisions has been that the, 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 the merging of the data set and the creation of this uh, uh, data set would not result in any uh, non-replicable -replic advantage for uh, the, uh, the merging entity. And, and, and somebody actually found this, uh, this um, decision very um, unsatisfactory and disappointing. If actually I look at the uh, Article 102 decision, of course, there have been a number of decisions against uh, uh, Google and the other uh, big tech adopted by the, the, uh, the Commission and by the other uh, others authority, but still the, uh, the, com the fines imposed were very, very high, but there were no actually need for uh, um, data sharing uh, obligation. So it really th seems that the um, uh, the competition and forces maybe are not I wouldn't say are not recognizing this uh, this, uh, this sounds like a paradox of course are not rec recognizing the importance of uh, data sharing but when they balance uh, the, um, the the risk of reducing the innovation incentives uh, to collect data and to improve the value of data collected with the benefit for uh, the economy and the society as a whole uh, to have more data sharing they actually are, are uh, prefer the uh, the the first the first one so and, and and just to just to uh, conclude um it was really striking then the uh, uh, the last decision in 2022 i think uh, uh, against the um, irish insurers uh, there was uh, an obligation of uh, a mandated uh, data access uh, uh, to the information exchange because the data set were was uh, really um, uh, thought to be unique and indispensable to compete for the other insurers on the market what is striking to me is that this is a very traditional sector. So, so this actually reminds the uh, uh, the decision which was uh, which were adopted in the past against uh, ex incumbent former incumbents like in the electricity sector in the gas sector where the data set was more the results of a legacy from from the past and there was no um, kind of innovative or uh, costly effort to gather the data set. Whenever uh, the data set was the results of the um, investment of the firm, then and there was a very cautious approach from the Commission and the, and the um, uh, uh, competition uh, enforcer to impose any data, any uh, data sharing, any data sharing obligation. And that's why, uh, to me, um, there was uh, uh, this need to uh, move towards uh, some kind of ex ante regulation, even though we heard that the, uh, this one um, uh, size fits all um, uh, approach can be not really effective because we have to um, assess a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, situation. Uh, so that was, um, this was what I want to um, bring to the discussion. Thank you, Mario. Uh, I think that is interesting and it's interesting also this, uh, uh, from one side, uh, recognition that uh, merger control is not uh, the right instrument to fix uh, such uh, uh, wide questions and also this discussion about uh, the the fact uh, that uh, here we have uh, definitely an issue of uh, market power in many situations and how this will be dealt by competition or regulation is an open issue by the way this is the main topic of the first panel of the afternoon so we will discuss this uh, more in depth also later in length uh, I would like to uh, open the floor. We have a few minutes for uh, discussion before I come back to our panelists. Uh, and also, if there are questions from our uh, audience online, uh, we'll, uh, they will be uh, read. 
uh, floor is open if you okay there are several questions let's uh, let's take a group of questions and then uh, we'll go back to our panelists okay well thank uh, hello i'm uh, uh, please uh, yes please uh, uh, even if we know each other uh, most yes. of us but uh, for also for the audience online please uh, state who you are when you ask questions thanks very good thank you uh, i'm scott marcus i'm a member of the scientific committee for the uh, center for digital society uh, and a long-standing member of the scientific committee for its predecessor program as well uh, so I, I think this has been a wonderful discussion i'd like to really come back to a question raised by dr barker which is simply about commercial incentives for a commercial entity uh, is the cost of providing the data greater than the benefits that seems to me a basic question and it seems to me that it doesn't critically rely on whether the commercial entity has market power or not uh, and this comes very much back to the points that uh that dr denny was making if the if the entity has invested in creating the data and if it derives commercial benefit i would say whether it has market power or not um, it might have a disincentive to provide it unless there was a reason to do so now, it, it seems to me the, uh, the examples given by Dr. Heller are, are only partly relevant because indeed for football data, the data can be monetized. If you look at patents, if you look at copyright, those forms of intellectual property, the data is public. Indeed, it's public, but the usage is restricted, which is what makes it possible to monetize. We also have the alternative intellectual property model of, of trade secrets. So again, monetization, I think, is really critical in these areas, and it could very well be that while we have a, a, a proverb that it is more blessed to give than to receive, when it comes to data that has commercial value for the firm, it may very well be more blessed to receive than to give. So a real, real question would be, how do we fix this? Now, in European legislation to date, there are a couple of conspicuous examples um, and uh, Dr. Manganelli, uh, an old friend, uh, has, has already raised several of them. Uh, if you look at the Open Data Directive, which is a successor to the Public Sector Information Directive, um, there, there's a compulsion for public entities or for utilities or for research projects funded by public entities to make the data public. There it's felt to be in the public good and the money came from the public in the first place. If you look at the electronic health data space, EHDS, which is one of the manifestations of the Data Governance Act, there again, there's a compulsion to make certain data available in electronic form. But there again, you've got a service where there's a, a, a very large public component. If you look at Data Governance Act as a whole, it creates mechanism to share, but doesn't really unlock the incentives problem. So really the question would be how to, how to fix this. Fundamentally, I would see it as a misalignment between private incentives versus societal welfare. How do we unlock that in the general case of firms that have commercial incentives but not market power? This goes very much back, I think, to the issues that uh, Dr. Denny was raising. So with that, thank you. Sorry if this was long-winded. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Alessandra Rossi, and I'm a um, uh, professor at the University of Chieti Pescara and part-time professor here uh, in the past few months. Uh, so I'd like to thank all the speakers for their insightful um, uh, presentations and connect. Uh, so my question is close in spirit to the previous one, uh, but I'd like to connect a bit clo more closely what Anna Barker was saying and um, Philip Heller. In particular, I was struck during the presentation by the statement that there is a problem of asymmetric uh, information with respect to data. And the reason why I was struck is that I immediately thought, you know, this is different from patents. In patents, you don't know exactly what's uh, the, the knowledge that's inside the patent, whereas for data, you can describe the structure of the data without disclosing the exact 
data that is inside. So uh, at first blush, it, it, it sounded to me that the problem of asymmetric information was less severe for data than for patents. But then I started thinking, connecting a little bit with what uh, Philip Heller was saying, so the parallel with patents. I started thinking that this is, after all, an empirical question. So I, I don't have a precise answer. This is my hunch, uh, but I, I actually don't know whether there is a strong problem of asymmetric information. But if there is a problem of asymmetric information, then it might be uh, possible to devise some solution similar to what happens in the patent system. In the patent system, you give protection, but in exchange of that protection, at least you ensure that a minimum amount of information on uh, the, the knowledge that is protected is shared. So there are patent databases that have a lot of problems of their own, but still, uh, it's it's a uh, one step for addressing this private uh, society <laughs> uh, societal welfare problem that was mentioned before. Uh, so my question is, uh, what information do we have for uh, stating that there is an asymmetric information uh, problem? And if so, would you be convinced by the idea that there might be an exante solution? that could be modeled some way, I don't know how, uh, on, on the, the similarly to what uh, happens to patents. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry. My name is Christian Ramsbach, and I'm um, a member of the OECD Secretariat serving the um, Data Governance and Privacy Working Party. And I have essentially two comments that I wanted to make, um, which ties very nicely to the previous two. The very first one about the incentive question. I mean, based, based on our work, um, a lot suggests that the reason why firms also don't want to share is essentially because of the concern of loss of control, which essentially means once you share the data, it's basically out there and it's very difficult to basically catch it back. Traditionally, the way we solve that problem is through intellectual property right indeed. But we have also kind of investigated that question. And um, the problem that you have with data, and this is, I think, a very important point to consider, is that very often data is co-created. So if I'm, as a company, invest in whatever services, or let's say even a hardware device, very often there is a consumer on the other hand that is using it. And by using it, it's generating a lot of the data. And the same is also true for businesses, so for the B2B uh, case. But that essentially means that whenever you want to put in place an intellectual property right regime, you need to take that into account, which is very challenging. Um, the key point here, however, is, um, and, I, and this is where I would like you to reflect on it, um, it seems that the way the European Commission is trying to address that problem is exactly through ex ante regulation, which is essentially trying to catch that problem and create some kind of quasi-intellectual property right regimes by, by assigning um, ownership rights or control rights. So I wanted to, to, to see with the panel if you would agree with that assessment that basically all those different regimes are a way to, to put in place, a, I wouldn't say, let's say ownership regime um, to solve the problem. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Lucrezio Figurelli. Uh, I work at Brattle. Um, thanks uh, for the great uh, uh, speeches from the panelists. I, I think th they triggered in me some uh, thoughts that I would like to share to see what the reaction is. It seems that um, data sharing will have, can have two very distinct purposes and benefits. Does data sharing that can facilitate the provision of public goods, and I'm referring that to the use of applications that Professor Parco showed at the beginning. And then there's a set of, uh, that, and then there's data sharing that can, uh, and excuse the economic jargon, improve the production function of a specific industry or many industries. Now, uh, 
having heard the various panelists, it seems to me that uh, a centralized approach for uh, enabling the provision of public goods for new use applications that are that should be seen as public goods uh, is probably effective. On the other hand, when we think about uh, data sharing that improves uh, production function in a given industry, that is something where market dynamics uh, are the traditional market dynamics and where issues can be competition issues like uh, market power. Um, and that's what I was thinking. Of course, there's an issue about privacy that I'm not touching here, that, uh, but anyway, I think that's important to address uh, in a centralized way. Uh, yes, uh, Ma Mario Siragusa, I am a, an, an antitrust lawyer, so to speak. Uh, I want to react to what was said as to the balancing between this incentive uh, that the company may have in sharing uh, the data and information vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the incentive. How do you balance? I think we have, uh, you know, important landmark case law of our Court of Justice, which has, of course, dealt with this issue in several cases, and I think has found a very good equilibrium by indicating what are the special circumstances which, uh, as such, to induce uh, to an obligation to share. No, we, uh, the Court of Justice has said that you have to show that there is, of course, market power, first of all, Secondly, that the, the, the information or the data is indispensable, that uh, the denial of access to the information uh, has a negative effect on technical development, and that the denial would have, of course, a restrictive effect on competition in a, down, in a downstream market. So those are the conditions which have been set by the court in a number of cases, which I think can apply in, in this case. And we have already example, uh, we will talk about that this afternoon, of cases in which these conditions have been applied in cases involving digital data. So uh, I don't think it's a new issue. It's an issue which has been dealt by the court and we have a very precise implications and indications which can be applied to what we are discussing. Okay, uh, thank you to all. Uh, we go to the, our panelists. Uh, we are a bit late so you have uh, two or three minutes each no more unfortunately uh, let me only add uh, for Anne Barker a question I didn't hear in the questions Anne spoke about coordination and, uh, uh, and the lack of coordination as an issue of the market failure then I would ask her why then we don't see emerging uh, that's a question for Anne but anybody wants more intermediaries because uh, where there are coordination issues normally intermediaries emerge. So that uh, seems to me a fair question. Uh, let's uh, follow the same order. Philip first. Okay, so I'll try to respond to some of the, the, the questions. So I mean, maybe on, on, on the first question, on the, the, the question of market power and whether the, the companies actually have market power, I think there it's important to distinguish between market power in some product market and then market power with regards to the provision of particular data. So if you make some device and you're competing with other firms, then you may have less market power in that original device market compared to the market power you have for the data that's generated by the devices you've already sold. Um, and, and, and then the, the question on, is on how to limit the market power with regards to the provision of the data and uh, how to fix the incentives there. And I think that's a very difficult problem because essentially the incentives are given by the economic environment and it's very hard to affect this. And so the, the, the only way I, I would see is to essentially t take those incentives as given and then essentially impose some obligations on sharing the data to the extent that that's considered to be necessary to improve the outcomes. And then we're essentially back to the question of uh, what these friend conditions can mean and how you can then actually determine what those friend conditions are in a particular case. Um, and, and then on, on the second question of the, on, on the asymmetric information, so I mean, there, I, I guess I also wouldn't know where uh, the asymmetric information is larger or smaller, whether it's patterns or, or, or data. I, mean, I guess that's, as, as, as you, you also said, an empirical question. 
Now, as regards the um, database of, of data there, I'm not so sure that this can work because essentially with patents, the idea is essentially that you publicize your in invention and as a reward for that, that invention is then protected and so you're able to exclude others from using that invention and in return, you know, you, you share that information and after 20 years, everyone can use it. But with data, essentially, the companies are already in the position that they can exclude others from using it and so uh, they, they already have that benefit of not having others use it and then some data after 20 years may not be so valuable. So if, if someone wanted to you know, sell me a drink to the snack or the, the lunch uh, I have this, this, this uh, today, then in 20 years time, that information I guess is less, less relevant uh, for, for, for companies. And so I think that the, the database may not be so, uh, so, so viable. Um, and um, I guess, that's the, the, the comments I had. And uh, if there are further questions, I'm, of course, happy to, to discuss afterwards over, over some coffee. Thank you, Philip. Anne, the floor is yours. Um, so I wouldn't want to overstate the asymmetric information issue. Um, I think with a lot of, for example, you know, larger players with market power, it's often understood the types of data they have and the sort of ad competitive advantage they have from that. So uh, I think their information asymmetries are probably more a play for less sophisticated businesses, for example. Um, and I, I really don't know, yeah, as a quantitative thing, how large that issue is. Um, I sort of thought I was trying to think a bit creatively, you know, usually when we have a positive externality, we look at taxes and subsidies, but I really can't think of a good way to do that in this scenario. So I will ponder that more. But um, yeah, usually when we have a positive externality, it's either you know you make you subsidise something, for example, to to make people um, do something that's got a greater good. Um, but I can't think how that would work in this case. Um, uh, I like the creative thinking around a database of data. I think. Philip has outlined some of the problems you would have with that. And data recency is something that is really important, especially for things like targeting and advertising. Um, Christine, it was nice to see you on screen. And uh, yeah, I, that was some really interesting insights that you've gleaned from the businesses wanting to maintain control. Um, and, and I totally understand your issues with the co-creation of data. Um, that is a really thorny issue. So. I don't have a great understanding of the EU ex ante regulation, so I might leave that question to others. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're looking at, Australia has a few different things in play. I think when you're talking about things like data portability, um, that gets around things like privacy and uh, it can help in certain scenarios. But the, the problem I see when you're trying to correct a market failure, uh, sorry, market power issue is you're really relying on the individuals with something like data portability and that has its own issues and getting enough people to share their data willingly in order to sort of correct for that market, um, that market uh, power imbalance. Um, so I might go as well to your question on coordination that was uh, specifically for me. Yeah, I think in some cases we do. I mean, data brokers are making an awful lot of money. Um, and I think it's, again, when it's very easy to identify something that can be monetized, um, that incentive is quite clear and people will come, you know, there isn't a huge market failure in that case. So data brokers, if you ever look into them, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting practices you'll see, like there's complete profiles of all sorts of people, um, both, mostly for the purposes of marketing and advertising. So I do think in some contexts, like those data markets are quite, uh, you know, quite uh, effective. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe where there is asymmetric information, you know, maybe a lot of the data isn't valuable. So in some cases, um, that's why I think data is really context specific. Um, so it's not that all data is going to be valuable. It's only going to be specific types of data. Um, so identification of those types of data, I think, is really important. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, when you get 
there, there's sort of a cascading thing when you get data. Often the value of a piece of data or a collection of data in isolation or two collections of data, the value of that will actually can be more than the sum of its parts when you when you add those data sets together. And I think that's a really interesting issue that's not always appreciate hasn't always been appreciated in competition um, assessment as well, because you know it's really more than the sum of its parts and even though there may be a lack of uniqueness in one of the data sets, or it may be easy to replicate parts of that data set, there is still a huge advantage to be had from combining data sets in that way. So anyway, a bit of uh, random reactions to the thoughts, but uh, I'm very sorry I'm not there to be able to continue the discussion. Thanks for having me though. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Antonio. Uh, just just a few comments on the, on the commercial incentive and the monetization. Of course, uh, I completely agree with uh, Scott Marcos that uh, monetization and incentive, commercial incentive, uh, are crucial. And uh, as uh, as as Perugi said, that that's that's quite a role that could be covered. Uh, also, because most of the time it's it's a problem of coordination and um, of course also the diminishing of, of, uh, of, of risk, of the perception of risk by, by intermediaries. And uh, which is also true in the, not only in the, uh, let's say in the B2B uh, market, but also as far as consumer are concerned, because one of the main, I mean, we, we are sh shifting a bit of focus, but one of the main uh, market failures uh, is, uh, uh, is not only the lack of transaction, but the incompleteness of market, so the fact that uh, especially for consumer, there is not a data market. And uh, this absence, uh, in a way, is driven by the legal system, uh, the regulation, the previous regulation, not the, the current one, but still in force. And, uh, but intermediaries, uh, of course, can, uh, let's say, overcome this problem. I mean, the, I'm referring to the uh, implicit uh, tacit exchange of data uh, for uh, free or uh, low-cost services especially with, with, with platforms, uh, of course intermediaries could uh, play a very important role there, aggregating and coordinating and consuming and raising their bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis platform, for example. And there, in that case, the creation of the market not necessarily could lead to an exchange of data. I mean, the data could still stay on the platform, but there could be a monetization of data on the, on the side of consumers, which, of course, uh, would, uh, would increase uh, uh, their, um, their position. And um, why, why intermediary are not emerging at, uh, so much, at least in Europe? I think it's in a way uh, related to what I said before. I mean, the, the, the uncertainty of the, of the legal framework, of course, could be a disincentive also for them. While on the opposite side, for example, in the Data Governance Act, there are very clear prescription rules about an inter how intermediary could be shaped. So, in, in these circumstances, instead, there could be more room for experimentation. So the rules could have left a more open, uh, open floor to different kind of intermediary models uh, in order to have some at least experimentation of business model and how to shape uh, this, uh, um, this intermediary function. Um, so this, in a way, on the other side, it's maybe the, the rules are, are too much prescriptive, especially for, for uh, a subject to, to let a subject emerge where there was no room before. So maybe some experimentation, some more freedom could be more efficient in this case. Yes, thank you, Antonio. Mario, the last word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, la very last word. We'll have a, topic, uh, we'll have a panel uh, this afternoon on the um, role that competition policy can, uh, can, can play. Um, so I think we can come back the, later on, 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 on this. I know that th there is this, uh, uh, the, the essential, uh, uh, the essential um, uh, uh, facility doctrine framework, which can be used, of course, and it's uh, a good balance, as uh, Professor Siagusa said, uh, between uh, private, private uh, incentive to innovate and uh, uh, some kind of obligation which can be uh, which can be imposed uh, I was just uh, noting that uh, 
I think after uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, this framework has never been used in the digital uh, in the digital sectors because uh, 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 there there was uh, uh, interoperability obligation imposed on Microsoft, but later on uh, uh, the, the Commission never imposed the other uh, uh, similar obligation on, on other uh, digital digital uh, platforms. Maybe it's uh, um, it's fair and it's reasonable from the from a competition uh, perspective. But then what I was thinking is that then maybe competition enforcement is not the uh, tool fit for purpose if we actually think that we want to address the market failure of law uh, 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 data sharing if we of course think that there is a market failure. So that was uh, uh, that my, um, uh, um, um, my actual thoughts. Thank you, Mario. Well, uh, we run a little bit, little bit late, uh, so we will stop uh, for uh, 20 minutes. We start now, 10 minutes doesn't work. I know there is the audience online. Uh, now we have to start 10 minutes, that's it. I think uh, then it's a question of the keynote speech. Okay, then we'll have a very short break of 10 minutes. So let's me thank our panelists for the great contribution and the audience. Thank you.